Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. G'day everyone, it's great to see you. We're about to start our church service for this Sunday, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you that you have the opportunity for us to open your word. And we ask that as we open your word, that you would open our hearts to your truth and that we would get to know you just that little bit more as a result of meeting with you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a Trojan horse. This is a picture of how the original Trojan horse might have looked. It appeared innocent enough, but it allowed the enemy into the city. And that's why a computer virus was called a Trojan horse. It appeared innocent enough, but it was, harm, it was a harmful piece of computer software that allowed hackers into the computer. It looked legitimate, but it tricked people into loading the wrong things into their systems. It gives a computer hacker access to cause damage. Unless you have a good antivirus program on your computer, you will get infected and your whole computer may crash. I should know, some years ago, I have had my computer cleaned of a Trojan horse virus. Nothing too serious that time, but more precautions were needed and, and a much better virus detector. And it cost me something. But on scanning my computer for viruses, once again, we were safe. <laughs> Genesis 20 in my Bible speaks about a believer who had a Trojan horse. Believers get hacked. I knew that already from other parts of the Bible. Satan is the original hacker. Right from the beginning, the Bible doesn't hide the truth about its stars of the faith who were infected. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Noah gets drunk and exposes himself. Lot, a believer does some pretty horrible things. Moses murders an Egyptian. David commits adultery with Bathsheba and murders Uriah, her husband. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament lie about their giving. And in Genesis 20, we find another person who lies. Abraham, the friend and prophet of God, lies about his wife. Here's how it happens in Genesis 20. Genesis 20 says, Abraham moved south to the Negev and lived for a while between Kadesh and Shur. And then he moved on to Gera. While living there as a foreigner, Abraham introduced his wife, Sarah, by saying, she is my sister. In Genesis 20, Abraham and Sarah tell people that they can what they consider to be a half truth. In Genesis 20 verse 12, by saying that Sarah is Abraham's sister, not his wife. She is actually a half sister, but this is still a full on lie. She is 90 years old and beautiful. Sarah catches your attention. The perfect Hollywood star aging gracefully and looking years younger without the use of liposuction, hair colouring, implants, facelifts and all the rest. <laughs> Sarah doesn't even wear makeup. 
She does, however, do a lot of walking and without the use of a walking frame. Perhaps that's the secret. Sarah's beauty regime, walk for miles in a desert climate. Now, there's a good tip for anybody who wants to preserve their beauty as they age. Go to Gira on foot, walk a desert marathon. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah are the original gray nomads. They take a caravan and travel. The only difference is that their caravan is made up of camels. There are some pretty rough characters around and Abraham is afraid of lawless places. You've got to be careful about where you park your caravan. I was speaking to some people from South Africa some time ago and they said that it can be dangerous to live in some parts of Johannesburg, especially if you have money. People do a lot to protect themselves. Barbed wire around their houses, large walls, alarm systems and guns. Abraham thinks people will see that he is married to a 90 year old beauty queen and they will kill him in order to take Sarah. The fear is real. The reasoning that results from it is a little twisted. But fear begets defense mechanisms and so Abraham lies to everyone, saying that Sarah is his sister. I don't know how this protects Sarah, who is probably pregnant at this time. Abraham justifies his lie because he feels his life will be endangered by telling people that he is married to this beautiful 90 year old woman. Why do we think we need to lie in order for God to keep us safe? I mean, do we really think that God needs me to sin in order for him to help us? Does God grant exemptions when it comes to telling lies? I can't say that God grants exceptions to sin. What about when I think I might be in danger myself if I tell the truth? Are there exceptions when God needs me to tell a lie in order for him to protect me? Well, I don't think so. What would that be saying about a totally sinless and holy God? I think I would have to accept the responsibility and consequences of my lies for myself and not bring God into it at all. I remember a remarkable sermon which reminded us that part of the armour that protects us from the devil is the belt of truth. The belt of truth speaks of living a life of integrity. It enables me to stand firm during the tough times. It was a, a great message. Abraham has taken off the belt of truth. He has allowed a Trojan horse to infect his spiritual life. His lie does nothing to protect and honour his pregnant wife, and for that matter, God's name. An innocent lie? No. But there are always consequences to sin. Look at the consequences for Abraham and Sarah. King Abimelech of Gerah sent for Sarah and had her brought to him at his palace. But that night, God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, You are a dead man, for that woman that you have taken is already married. But Abimelech had not touched her yet, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me she is my sister? And she herself said, yes, he is my brother. I acted in complete innocence. My hands are clean. In the dream, God responded, yes, I know that you are innocent. And that's why I kept you from sinning against me. Why I did not let you touch her. Now return the woman to her husband and he will pray for you. For he is a prophet and then you will live. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and all your people will die. Notice that God called Abraham a prophet. This is the first time the word prophet is used in the Bible. But Abraham is a flawed prophet. 
The real hero in this story is the underdog who gets caught up in the life and death struggle by mistake. Abimelech. Abimelech probably thinking that he can form an alliance with Abraham, who is a wealthy man, decides to take Sarah into his harem. Abimelech may be the co-star in this movie, but he deserves the Oscar. When God speaks to him in a dream and says that he is a dead man for taking Sarah into his harem, he says, Lord, I'm innocent. And he wakes up in a cold sweat. Abimelech is the man with more integrity and character than Abraham, who is described as a prophet of God. He looks more like the believer than Abraham the liar. In this case, Abraham is the bad guy, the perpetrator of this mess. And it all starts off with a minor sin which escalates to something which threatens future generations. As a believer, you can ask God to scan your life for areas of deception that indicate that your life is in crash mode. He can clean the system. You can start afresh through the cleansing work of Christ. 1 John 1 9 is the top range antivirus system around and it's quite free. It says this, it says, but if we confess our sins to him, that is God, He is faithful, that means he'll always do it, and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all wickedness. Maximum protection, no infected files. So back to the story. How is this all put right? What happens to Abimelech and his kingdom? Well, (laughs) you're going to have to find out next week when we continue with this wonderful story of Abraham. God bless. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. And I thank you for your word. And I thank you that we can live lives of integrity before you. We thank you, Father, that you would help us to be people of integrity. And we ask, Lord, for you to help us to get to know you as a result of this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.